Mm-hmm. We're in Nun Beis Amud Aleph, we're in 52A1. So we have a machlokus between uh, Abai and Rava, and we're trying to say that that the uh, machlokus between Abai and Rava is really a machlokus that already Tanoim argued about, Rabbi Lazar and uh, Rabbi Nasa. So, so what at the bottom of Nun Aleph Amud Beis, Abai said, Let's say an almana is married to a coin gadol, or let's say that a regular coin is married to a divorcee. So it's a, a marriage you're not allowed to 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 be involved in, but the kedushin took effect. So if this coin's wife got uh, taken captive, would they have to? Would they ha- Would he have to redeem her? So Abaye says yes, because the ksuva or the the requirement is that as a for a, if a, a kohen husband. Would say that uh, in case you would you my wife would get uh, uh, taken captive, I will redeem you and return you to your city. Meaning they can't remain married, but since the remain married isn't part of this clause, uh, he can redeem her, and he's obligated to redeem her. And Rava says not because the only time that he would be obligated to redeem her and then send her back to her to her city is when the captivity is what made her usher to be married to him. So as a Kohen, if his wife was, was uh, if, if a non-Jew had relations with her, it gives her the halachic status of his owner. Now he wouldn't be allowed to marry her. But since she was previously already not allowed to be, marry her, so then he's not obligated to redeem her. So we wanted to say that it's machlokis tanaim, that if someone said that uh, he made a a uh, a vow on his wife that she won't receive any benefit from him, and then she becomes taken to hostage. If he f- gets her freed, if he redeems her, then she's getting benefit from him. So what should he do? Trebeliezer says that he redeems her, and he has to give her her ksuva. He can't stay married anymore. And Rabbi Yeshua says that he can he uh, he has to give her the ksuva, and he doesn't redeem her. So the Gemara tried to say. So, so why don't we say that this is a machlokus where uh, the the man who made this vow was a kohen, and Rabbi Lezer who says you have to redeem her and then you get divorced holds like Abaye, or Abaye holds like Rabbi Lezer, and Rabbi holds like Rabbi Yeshua that uh, you don't have to redeem her. So the Gemara says no. It says a case where it's actually pretty unusual, or it's, it doesn't fit in with the lashon so well. But that's what the Gemara says that she made the vow that she's not going to get any benefit from him. And then the husband confirmed it. Because in the case of, of a married woman, her husband is allowed to confirm her her vows. In the case of a girl, it's her her father. So it's a case where she made the vow and, and he he didn't veto it. I, sh- I mean, uh, so the Gemara says... Why did she make the vow? She made some type of vow. I'm not going to... I don't want any benefit from you. Why would she do that? And mm-hmm. and, 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 and I, I, I'm sorry, I have a big problem with that. And then also, it, you, you were saying previously, that he would hand her, uh, let's say not redeem her, but hand her the consumer. How can he <laughs> hand her the consumer if she's in captivity? Well, he doesn't hand her, but he would pay it out to her, or give give it How to her. He her. She's in captivity, like now. Well, you know? so, so he would go to the base then and open a trust fund and say, this is my wife's consumer. Well, we mentioned this question a, a week or two ago yeah. that why can he divorce her when she's in captivity and then not have to redeem her? So I pointed mm-hmm. out that we know from Gemara's about, let's say, when Rabbi Akiva was in jail and this and that, that uh, the thing that they would bring in the water. So the jail didn't give three squares a day in those days. The, his Talmud and whatever had to bring in the water. And the Romans said, oh, you have so much water, you're you're loosening the earth suffering the earth to dig out. So they poured half of it out, but it ended up half of it was what he needed for Natil Siadayim, and the other half was what he was going to drink from. So that day he didn't drink because he washed to eat his bread and he didn't have anything left over to drink. So it could be depending on the captivity and and well, captivity for, Ma- for Malchus is probably different than this captivity, yeah. Yeah. but it's possible that you could have some type of interactions, but you're still being you know separate. You know where they are. You could put letters through you know, through the, through uh, some type of slat or slit or window or whatever. But you're right. So obviously he doesn't have to, he can't literally uh, uh, give her the ksuva. So uh, Rashi says,
that because of this vow, they're not able to stay married. So it seems that when she would get freed, he would have to divorce her. And that's when he would give her the ksuva. So there's nothing here about a trust fund. So the case is, is that, so she made the vow that she wasn't going to get benefit from him and he didn't, uh, so it's the Gemara says, Ihi kiyem. Uh, she did vikiyem, and he was Makaim the netter. So I don't think you literally have to say uh, he doesn't have to confirm it, but if he doesn't veto it in a, in a, in, in a day or on the day he hears about it, it stays. So Rebbe Lezer holds that because he uh, confirmed her vow, now she is... Uh, that's why she can't be redeemed because of what he did. So therefore, he has to redeem her and can't stay married. And Rabbi Yeshua holds that she's the one who made the vow in the first place. So even though he he confirmed it, but she was the one who caused it. So therefore, he doesn't have to uh, redeem her. So then the Gemara says, so this is on 52A2. The, I think we did this, but we'll just read it again, the second paragraph. But if it's all her fault, because she was the one who uh, who made the vow, ksuva mayavirite. Why do we talk about the ksuva? Because if if a, if a wife does something to certain things to destroy, uh, to ruin the marriage, she loses out her ksuva. So why would why would he she get the ksuva? Vesu amar Rabbi Nasan shalti asumchos kisha amar Rabbi Nasan nosin v'ksuva sevenapoda. Uh, so Rabbi Nasan said in the Mishnah, that I asked Sumchus when Rabbi Yeshua says that he gives her the ksuva and he doesn't have to redeem her, Kishidir Lusof Nishbe, so Benishbisof Adira. Is that in a case where she took this vow first and then she became a captive later? Or is it true even if she got captive first and then the vow was taken? Va'amar and Sumchus said, Lo Shamati, I didn't hear the, the, the answer to, this, to your question. Vi'i Dinadra Ihi, Mali Hidir Lusof Nishbis. But if she's the one who made the vow, it shouldn't matter if if uh, she made the vow before she got taken captive or she made the vow uh, after she was taken captive. So in that case, we could say that other people were taken captive with her and they told us that she made the vow. So that's how we would know that she could have taken any uh, a vow. But it doesn't matter if Rabbi Nelson holds, excuse me, if, if Rabbi Yeshua holds that she's the one who caused it, whether she caused it before she was taken captive or after, if she caused it, she shouldn't be redeemed. So the way that Gemara is explaining the situation right now doesn't fit the words of the Mishnah, in the case of the Mishnah. So I, Ella Laola... I always feel uh, vindicated when I'm having a problem and it says to her, uh, the commentators find this Gemara difficult. Uh, you know. Right, right. Once, I don't remember what, I was reading a Mishnah. The Mishnah made no sense. I had a giant question on the Mishnah. I look in all the commentaries. I don't see it. I'm all dejected. Then I read the Gemara. It's the first question the Gemara asks on the Mishnah. Yep. <laughs> so, Eliolam da Adra Ihu. So, it has to be a case where he made a vow. And Abai explains it to his understanding, and Rava explains it to his understanding. Abai Mitarza Tame, Abai explains it his answer that uh so Abai is the one who holds that uh since they were already married, even though it was with an Avera, uh he redeems her. A widow for a coin god all, which is a prohibition to marry, everyone agrees that he's obligated to redeem her. Mamzer Sud. But a mamzer or nasin, which is this has the same status of a mamzer, uh, you're not. Everyone agrees that you're not. Um, is that so? In this case, I don't know if he means this dafka or not, but uh, he's saying if she's a mamzeris and he's a regular Israel, uh, so he, he's not obligated to redeem her. But what about if he was uh, if he was the mamzer and and she was a regular Yisraelis, so he's not allowed to be married to her anyway, either. Uh, would he redeem her? I don't know if it says that that... Uh, it, it probably means it both ways. Madar Nami. So in the case 
wear the wife of the Kohen and there's this vow that she's not going to get benefit from him. Everyone agrees that you have to redeem her because it's the same case as a widow to a kind of God. When is the Machlokas in the Mishnah between uh, uh, Rebbe Lazar and uh, Rebbe Lazar and Rebbe Yeshua is Bamadar Eishis Yisrael. If you had made the vow against uh, the wife of a, a regular Yisrael, the regular Yisrael, even if his wife was raped, she's a lot. They're allowed to stay married. Rabbi Lezer Azar Basam Eikara. Rabbi Lezer follows the beginning. Rabbi Shua Azal Basul Basof. And Rabbi Shua follows the end. So Abai says that Rabbi Yeshua is saying that she's the one who caused the problem. So she doesn't get uh, redeemed. And Rabbi Lazar holds that he was the one who caused the problem because he didn't... Um, no, wait, this is a different Rashi. Oh, keep, I read the wrong Rashi. Sorry, keep looking at Yisrael Shudir's niche, though. Oh, uh, so the 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 condition in the ksuva, or the obligation is, I will redeem you, and you will return me to, and and you will return as my wife. So there's two different clauses that don't necessarily work the same way. So do we focus on the part I will redeem you, or the 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 first two words of the clause, or do we focus on the last two words of the clause to be my wife? So. Rebbe Lazar follows the first two, the those first two words that I will take that I will redeem you, and Rabbi Shua follows the last two words that to be my wife. And since in this case, because of the vow, they can't be married, that's why uh, he doesn't. Um, that's why he doesn't redeem her. And Rava Mitarza Tame and Rava would explain the the machlokas in the mission according to his reasoning. Both a widow to her coin gadol, and as I said, also a divorcee to a regular coin, or a mamzeris and a see, or a mamzeris married to Yisrael, uh, they all agree. Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shur, they both agree that you don't redeem her. Keep ligi b'mader. They only argue in the case of the vow. Beinachis coin of beinachis Yisrael. Whether the husband is a coin, whether the the husband is Yisrael. Rabbi Lazar also baser meikara. Rabbi Lazar follows. The the uh, beginning part that uh, oh, art school is explaining it a, a little different than I said. Rabbi Eliezer also besser me kara. Rabbi Shua also also lebasol lebasof. Rabbi Eliezer holds you follow the beginning. When the condition to return her to the city for a coin or to be the wife of Yisrael was made, and Rabbi Shua holds that it's at the end when it has to be fulfilled. So at the time when the when the when the condition was made, uh, she hadn't. No one had made a vow, and they and they were allowed to to live together. So because at the time that it was made, uh, he's allowed to. He has to redeem her. But Rabbi Shua holds you follow the end, and excuse me. No, 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 no. Rabbi Yezer is the one who holds that you redeem her. All oh, right, so because so you have to redeem her because at the time you made the the condition, you were able to redeem her. But Rabbi Yoshua holds, as of now, what's the condition right now? Is he able to take her back and be married to her? No. So even though he may had full intention of fulfilling it when he made it, but right now because they're not allowed to be married anymore, now Bilba Sof at the end when uh, 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 after this vow has been made. Because he can't fulfill the vow anymore, he doesn't have to fulfill it and, and doesn't have to even redeem and doesn't have to redeem her at all. Okay, the two dots. Nish b'schayv l'fdosa. So if she got taken captive, a husband is obligated to redeem his wife. Ten rabbanan nish b'schayv b'al, b'achar kach meis b'al, 
if she was um, taken captive while her husband was alive and her husband died and she's still in captivity. Hikr Labala, if the husband knew about the fact that she was taking hostage, Yarshin Chayav and Liftosa, his heirs are obligated to redeem her. Again, Marty is going to understand what kind of situation is it if he doesn't know if she was captured or not. So, uh, I mean, the simplest case would be a case where he was traveling overseas. So he wasn't, he didn't know what was going on locally by him. I mean, by by her. Yeah. If the husband was not aware of that she was taken captive before he died, the heirs are not obligated to redeem her. Levi wanted to pass in like this Mishnah, that someone was... Uh, someone's wife was taken captive, and he, and uh, and he died, and Levi was going to paskin. Uh, based on this, Amar Le Rav Rav said to him, "Hachi Amar Habibi, uh, my dear one, Rabbi Chia, who was his uncle, uh, taught me Le Silchos Hakiyamasni." So we don't paskin like that Mishnah. Eliki Hadatanya, we follow like the following Brisa. Nishbis LaAcher Misas Baila. If she was captured. After her husband died, the orphans, so meaning the the kids who remain, and these I mean Yosomim usually means that they're they're minors, they're not obligated to redeem her. Oh, and not and and not only are they not obligated to redeem her, if she was captive while her husband was alive and then her husband died, the the orphans, the who the the estate goes to them. They are not obligated to redeem her. Because the stipulation of I will redeem you and return you as my wife doesn't apply anymore. Because uh because uh because he's dead. Hold on a second. So I mean it happens to be that when the husband dies with the first mission Kedushin, the marriage ends. Because the the woman is acquired in three ways, kasef shtar and bia v'konas asur b'shtei drachim. She acquires herself in two ways, either with the get or with her husband dying. So even though they're not married anymore, the 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 ksuva is still a doc is is a is a document. And I guess because of the conditions in it, the conditions still must be fulfilled. But we're saying, but uh, we're passing like this brisa that says because. He can't be married to her anymore because he's dead. The uh, uh, so the the uh, the the kids, his son, his kids who are in charge of fulfilling the remaining terms of the ksuva, and what does how things that we've been talking about, how much he they have to they have to give her for food or this or that or the we saw about the perfume a few weeks uh, maybe four weeks ago already, so uh. They do not have to pay to redeem her, at least not in the ksuva. I mean, it, it, it does it. Let's say that these kids, that there was only one marriage and only one wife. So these kids would be her kids. Do you have a special obligation to redeem your your? Uh, family members, as opposed to as as opposed to someone who's not, is it part of uh, kibbutz or whatever? It, there, I I I haven't seen a source lately. I haven't gone through so much, but I've gone through part of the sugi. I haven't seen any source that says it. There is a gemara in Gittin that a certain uh, person paid I don't know twelve thousand uh, gold coins, or whatever, to redeem his daughter. And Abai, I think it was Abai said in the gemara there that who says that uh, that the chachamim were that he listened to the chachamim. Meaning Dagmar was saying you can't overpay for captives. So the question is, is the reason because you'll impoverish the community or is the reason that they might take more hostages if it's such a lucrative business? And the Nafkamina is if it's not going to impoverish the community. And they brought this incident that this certain person, Levi by someone paid like 12000 uh, to redeem his daughter. And and uh, Abai says, well, who said that? So that case, it's not going to impoverish the community because it's, uh, no communal funds are being used for it. But if they see it's lucrative, it's still, you know, it might make it worse in the future that more people might be taken hostage. So, but it, it, 
I haven't seen anyone say, oh, but if a parent, the kids have an as, obligation to redeem their parents. There doesn't seem to be any special din of redeeming your parents. So I just want to point that out. But all, um, okay, because um, but it's a, it's a tough sugya. I hate to put it this way: a strong tradition, uh, the, you know, in, in Judaism to do that. Um, what? To try to get it. certainly your mother, but certainly any any right. We redeem house. that. We redeem the hostages. We try not to overpay. Well, so Al, yeah. So Ali just found last week or two weeks ago because you know when they released uh, you know twelve hundred or a thousand whatever for Gilad Shalit, he gave Shurman this again and he was very critical. He just yeah. saw Netanyahu's book that Netanyahu basically was saying if we got this done, he thought up that that Obama was going to give him was going to let him and not object to him bombing Iran's stuff. So the reason, even though for that, for, for the specific one hostage, it may, it may have been an overpayment, but in order to be able to save that, he thought he was going to have to save, you know, Kaisha by doing that, that was the price that was going to have to pay. So Ellie says, I'm going to have to reevaluate. And I, so Ellie sent, he, Ellie said, I was very critical at the time, but now that I know that this is the backstory, I would have to reevaluate it. So the other well, thing I, I have to reevaluate what I thought of Netanyahu. <laughs> well, no, the point is, is was was it an overpayment or not? Yeah. If well, it was gonna if well, doing that would have allowed them to do other things to strengthen the defense. Well, I think he was stupid to expect Obama to okay that. Oh uh, right, oh, oh, oh that part, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Right. So, but the other thing that I'm that I'm that I having trouble with and just in general is that it seems that we don't say that Shvuyim are in Sakanas Nefashos. So, uh, redeeming captives is certainly a, a, a giant mitzvah, the Gemara says in Baba Basra. Yeah. But are they considered in Sakanas Nefashos? And I would, I think that the answer is no, because if they were, well, see, the reason that we don't overpay is because Tikkun Olam. It might be from the strict halacha you can, but it's this Tikkun Olam. So you really have to understand what Tikkun Olam is because it ends up being that we, we're, 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 we're saying you can't take someone out of danger now because it might cause more people in the future to become into danger. We don't usually say, if someone's usually in danger now, we're not worried about someone else coming into danger later. So either that there's no, we're, we're talking about cases where it's not Sakana to be in the house, in the captivity, or it is, but because of this worry that it was going to cause the communities to completely run out of money, and to have all these captives, they made this takana mipnei tikuna olam that Chachamim felt that it was that we 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 weren't allowed to always pay whatever it takes to redeem. I don't know. Okay, uh, Tanara Banan. So it's this the third line from the bottom or the last paragraph in fifty two a three. Tanara Banan. We learned in the Brice and Nishbis if a wife. Uh, was ca uh, it was uh, was a captive? But you with the and the captors were were so. This is the ransom demand. The ransom demand was ten times her value. So Rashi says that when we say her value, it means her value, like we you would take in the case of Nizikin. We would see how much she's worth on the slave market, and let's say she was worth a thousand dollars, and they were asking for ten thousand dollars. So Pamri Shona Poda, if she was held uh, hostage once, he can redeem her for this amount. But if she got held, ca taken ha uh, captive another time, Ratsa Poda, Ratsa Eina Poda. If he wants to, he's allowed to, but he's not obligated to pay this uh, very high sum. So Rashi says, because the Chachamim, when they put in the Ksuba that he has to um, redeem her, they only held that he has to redeem her once. So this isn't, the Ksuva isn't saying that he always has to redeem her, but if she gets held, taken captive once, he has to redeem her. So Tosvos says, according the way Tosvos understands Rashi, is that um, he's not allowed to redeem her any other times. But from the Gemara, it says, that if he wants to, he can, and if uh, he he can, and if he doesn't want to, he doesn't he doesn't have to. So he thinks that Rashi is doesn't fit in with the Gemara. 
even if they're not charging uh, high values. Because according to because according to the, the text of the Mishnah, they were asking 10 times her value, the first time redeem her. From now on, if he wants to, he can redeem her. If he, if he doesn't want to, he doesn't have to. Well, what if the next time they're just asking for a regular market value, so they're not overcharging him? So Rashi says, no, you don't, you don't have to because you only have to redeem her once. But from the fact that we that this Gemara started out by saying they're asking an extreme, uh, an extreme amount, it makes it sound like if they would only be asking lower amounts, you could redeem her every time. So, so. So he ends up saying that according to Rashi, they have this claim, this uh, condition in it, but it's a very unusual thing that it would have to be fulfilled. And then he brings the Rach, Tosos brings the Rach, that uh, the way that I just said that we could read it, that if they're asking ex exceptionally high amount, the first time you redeem her, the second time, if you want to, you can, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But the Rach says if the second time, that's only if they're asking the, the super high value the second time. But if they're asking, demanding just her regular value, then you you do redeem her. So then Tosis has a question against that, but uh, according to Rashi, you only redeem her once. And then, but the question is, if the other times... Uh, even even if the, according to Rashi, even if the other time is at a market value, it's not overcharging. And the Rach argues on Rashi. Uh, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel Omer, as we turn to Nun Beis Amid Beis, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says, "Ain't potum sashum yosar kedet me bepnei tikkun olam." So this is the Gemara just quoted for, for Gemara from Gittin. We do not redeem hostages for more than or captives more than their value because of tikkun olam. So Rashi says, and over here Rashi says. We so they so that uh the the I guess the the captors won't uh overcharge. So Tikuna Olam benefit of society. So according to Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, even the first time you can't redeem her because there's a Takan we've made Tikuna Olam that you don't uh overpay to redeem hostages, the captives. So the Gemara says, But again, from the reading the Gemara, if they were asking 10 times, the first time you redeem. But that implies that if they, she would, they were asking regular value, you would redeem her. Even if it costs more than the value of her ksuva is. Because the, the, the thing is, is that let's say the ksuva is, is, is $5,000. Or the standard suva is two two hundred zuz, and let's say that it's going to cost him two hundred and fifty zuz to redeem her. So the suva says the suva, which is obligating him in this amount, also has this clause, which even if it's not written, is is a automatic clause that he has to redeem her. It doesn't make sense that he has to pay more than the value of the suva to fulfill that clause. The suva is up to that amount. So the Gemara right now is saying that this Bryce implies that. He would have to redeem her even if her market cost is worth more than the value of the ksuva. Or a minhi, but I'll ask you a contradiction. So what we mean, well, it doesn't seem to be a good thing that if, if her ksuva is, is, is less than her, than her value. So a situation could be, let's say, uh, Reb Simchazali Grieger, the Dina Brisk, his wife was like paralyzed. And she couldn't even eat herself, so he she uh, so she he would feed her and this and that. So let's say they got married, and then she had an illness or stroke or some accident, and then she couldn't really move. So what are you worth on a slave market if you can't move? You're not worth anything. So that's a case where uh, where her uh, her value on the slave market would be less than her ksuva. It's not saying that her ksuva is undervaluing her, but it could have been that there could have been some type of stroke or or accident. Or Minhi, I'll ask you a contradiction. She was held captive, and they were asking up to 10 times the value of her ksuva. Pam Rishona Poda, the first time did we uh, the husband will uh, has to redeem her. If he wants to redeem her, if he wants, if he doesn't want to, he doesn't have to. 
Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, Amar Imahaya Perkona Keneg Suvaso Pode. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says that if the the ransom was worth the the value of the ksuva, then he does redeem her. Imlav ain't a pode. And if not, he doesn't redeem her. So it seems that there is no limitation of Mipnei Tikkun Olam. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel was the one who says you can't overpay because of Tikkun Olam for the benefit of society. And here he says, as long as it's within the, the value of Riksuva, the husband has to redeem her. So, the, so that's a contradiction between the, Shimon, the opinion of Rabbi Shimon Gamliel. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, Trekula Isle. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel has two leniencies. So one leniency is you can't overpay for her value in the um, in the slave market, but also you don't pay more than her value in the ksuva. So it seems they might be two separate, uh, uh, two separate kulas. So even though um, sh this is more than what she's worth on the slave market, but because it's less than what her ksuva is, uh, the husband is allowed to pay that amount. So now we see, according to the minhag, you know, that the, or the the practice that near Tishal, they put in uh, values and certain. I think I heard that as Moroccans, they put in the numbers with a lot of sixes. You have to put in sixty six million uh, six hundred sixty six thousand six hundred sixty sixty six shekel and sixty six agarot that uh, they're putting the husband in a bad case uh, in the for this uh, for this uh, not chasusham lo aleinu it shouldn't happen. But uh, in order to, if he would have to pay a lot of money to redeem his wife. Okay. Two dots. Luxa Chaylor Posa. If she got sick, he has to get her better. Tanarabanan, we learned in the Braisa. Almanan Yizodos Menichse Yisomen. A widow gets fed from the property of the orphans, meaning uh, her husband's kids. Could be her kids, it might be not her kids. And if she needs uh, a medical treatment, this is like food which must be provided. If there is a set amount to this, it's it's not an open ended treatment. If there's a set amount, then she gets paid from the ksuva. But if it's uh, an open ended refua, then it's like food. So in this case, it seems that uh, an, uh, that a, we might think that if you need a, a limited treatment and you're going to get better, that might be a, be a re better reason to pay it, right? It's not ongoing, but this logic is the app is a little bit seems to me the opposite. I'm not saying it's wrong, but the opposite is if it's an open ended thing, then it's like food. It needs to be done. So we're going to see a little bit later on in a few lines down, actually, that what is this refua? So it's not that you have to deal with your HMO or PPO, which can be very annoying. It's simpler. It seems in those days, the refua was just going to the blood letter. So that was something that was common. A lot of people did it. And it's not like nowadays that uh, these insurance bills could be hundreds or uh, uh, it could be a hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of dollars or more for treatment. Or we know that there's certain uh, drugs that are rare and they're very expensive. Or Pharma Bro, who bought the company with some type of medicine and then what made it 50 times more expensive. Which was legal, but then because he was he because he behaved in such a bad manner, they looked at him with a fine tooth comb and found a different way to indict him and find him guilty on. I'm Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says, Asu hakazas Yisrael la They made letting blood in Eretz Yisrael like a refuah that has no limit. So meaning uh, uh, in Eretz Yisrael, having the blood let was something that regularly maintenance and it was done all, if, you know, forever. It wasn't for a temporary illness or whatever. So that's like Mizono. So the the kids, even the Yusomen, would have to pay for their father's widow, which could be their mother, might not be, to have her blood let on a regular basis. Previd Rabbi Yochanan Havili Luhu Itas Abba a relative of Rabbi Yochanan had their father's wife, and their father had died, so they had to pay for her uh, food from the ksuva, or from his estate, I should say, to have a strich or full kayama. She needed every day. So I assume, again, in this case, when it says strich or refua, that she needed refua, it meant she needed her blood lead every day.
also commit Rabbi Yochanan. They came to Rabbi Yochanan. So they said, we have to pay this money. It's expensive to do it every single day. See if you can cut a deal with the doctor who you'll, you'll, you'll like an annuity. You'll pay him this much and he'll take care of her every day. And then if the doctor is willing to do that, Then Rashi says, if he's willing to do that, then it becomes a not ongoing thing. And then it's not like Mizonos, and he wouldn't have to pay, at least not according to Rabbi Shimon Gamliel. I'm Rabbi Yochanan, Asino, it's me, We made ourselves like lawyers. So the Mishnah Pirkei says, you're not allowed to be Koarche but, uh, uh, but Rabbi Yochanan was saying, by him suggesting this, he became like Orche Dayana. So Rashi, Rashi says, what does it mean that, what, when is it usher to be like this? If you love one of the parties in the lawsuit, and therefore you are uh, finding some type of uh, sweetheart deal. So, uh, it, so because you're, you, you like someone so much, you're trying to get a sweetheart deal. That's what you're not supposed to do. So Rabbi Yochanan was upset that he ended up, uh, that it ends up that he did, but getting the sweetheart deal that to get his relatives off from having to pay for it was a korche de'anim. So So why at the beginning did he, did he suggest it? Well, my sabar. And in the end, when he was upset that he had gave this advice, what did he hope? So mekara sabar mibsarcha lo Originally, he held a pasuk in Yeshaya. It's in a Torah that we say at some point. I think on Yom Kippur. Maybe it's not, but, but uh, from your flesh, do not uh, hide. So you have to figure out a way to help. Well, the sof suffer Adam Chashuv Shani. But then he held that an important person is is different. So uh, because he came up with this innovative uh, way. Uh, for someone regular person would have thought of it, it's okay. But because he's an Adam Chashev, then he shouldn't have advised them this way. I'm still... I still, I don't, I still don't fully understand this Gemara. Because here, here's what I, unless this is, we assume, or I may be wrongly assume that Mibsarcha Lotisale means you you can't, because who's the Mibsarcha in this case? In this case, the relatives wasn't wasn't the wasn't the widow of their father. They were related to her. It was their father's widow. It wasn't their mother. It doesn't sound like it. So they had no special. Uh, obligation to 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 feed her. So who's the relation here? The relative here is Rabbi Yochanan and his cousins. He's trying to think of a way for his cousins to be able to keep more money. So he came up with a way, oh, if the doctor's willing, you're getting a lifetime deal that her blood will get let as long as she lives, then it becomes a, a temporary expense. And the temporary expense gets paid from the ksuba, not from, not, not, not like food. And food is ongoing, you know, for the rest of her life. So he's saving her money. So it seems that that the the troop shot in the Gemara is that originally told me not in regard to healing, but he was trying to find a way that would be good economically for his relatives, and that would be find this lump sum. But then at the end, he held that Adam Chashuv Shani. He came up with this thing to save them money, but uh, he shouldn't have given such an advice. Mishnah. Low cost of laban and different to have a lichi minai in on yartin kesuk suvaychi. Yes, sir. Al chukan and dimachai. So this is what we call. We we saw this a few weeks ago. The ksuva is ban and different. The ksuva of the male sons. So ban and different. The male sons. The the yavu lichi minai that I will have. Uh, that you will have from me. So meaning this is your male sons from our marriage. They're going to inherit the money of your ksuva. More than the portion with their brothers. 
So basically we're saying, and so we saw this a few weeks ago that uh, on a, on a, on a, on a Torah level, so if he was married once and married a second time or married to more than one wife at once, so he has sons from different wives, the, the, the sons would split the estate. They have Yerusha, but, um, but, but the Chachamim said that the, that there, there, there's this, uh, tonight, and we're going to see this mission is telling us, even if you didn't write it, it exists because the Chachamim made it an automatic is that off the top of his estate, uh, when when he dies, each of his wives' sons will get the value of their ksuva off the top, and then the Yerusha comes from what's left, if there's anything left. So if he did it, so if he didn't write this clause, Chayev, it still uh, happens that they're going to get the money that the sons will get the money of their mother mother's ksuva off the top. Shahu tanai basin because it's a condition of the basin. And here's another uh, clause. Your female daughters that you will have from me, well, I mean female children, they will live in my house and get fed from my properties until they get married. Now, you know, uh, nowadays things are crazy, but the, the text of the Mishnah means until they are taken uh, uh, to their husbands. Uh, so uh, they still, his estate has to pay for the daughter's uh, food until they get married, because it's a condition of the basin. If he didn't write the following clause, you will stay living in my house and get fed from my uh, properties. As long as you stay a widow in my house, meaning she didn't get remarried to so, or she didn't marry someone else after that. Chayev, uh, his heirs are obligated to support her from his estate like this, even if they didn't write in the Ksuba Shu Tanai Basin, because it is a condition of the Basin. This is how the, the men of Yushalim used to write the Ksuba uh, uh, with this last clause that we just said. And the men of Galil wrote the same way as the Yushalim. But the people of Yehuda, so I mean, Yushalim was part of Yehuda, so why is it separate? I mean, I don't know. You I mean Yerushalayim itself wasn't part of any uh, shevet, but uh, it was a it was right next to Yehuda shevet. But ad sheyir to a yosh and liten lach tuva seich, the men of of Yehuda would write that they my, that that my, you know my ears will feed you until they want to give you your ksuva. Lafika chimratu yorshim nosin lach tuva so poshin also. Therefore, if the kids didn't want to keep paying for her, they could pay her the whole ksuva, and then they don't have to support her anymore. Why did the why did the Chachamim institute this ksuva of the male children that they get the ksuva of their mother before even before any Yerusha takes place? In order that a person will will the light a fire under him, the yikpot means he'll jump, and he's going to write money in his ksuva. In, 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 and he'll he'll give money for his daughters as a dowry, just like she would have been a son. And um, like his, his son gets a portion. The women, the uh, girls, don't get a portion when there's a son. So it's to in, it's to get him to write a large dowry for his daughters. Umika midi drachman amar barad laros barato lolertos vasra banu mistakni deteros brata. So does it make sense that does it exist that uh, the Torah says that sons get Yerusha? Daughters don't get Yerusha, and the Rabbanan came, and they basically made a thing that daughters are going to get inherit by getting this big dowry. So Hanami uh, to give them this dowry is also Diraisa. So this pasuk isn't in the Chumash; it's in Yermia, but it says, "Take wives, give birth to so to sons and daughters, and take." Uh, uh, for your sons' wives and your daughters give to men. So we understand that he it's in your hand to get your son married up. But is it in your hands to marry off the daughter? So I mean, it's true that the husband, that the father, if she's a katana, the husband, the father, 
can uh, can accept the kedusha, but he can't make anyone marry her, right? He can't convince them uh, to marry Ella Hagmash Milan. The nilbush of anichse venase of lamidi. Rather, it means you dress her nicely, give her property, or write this the, the dowry, and give her something. So people will be willing to run after her and they want to marry her. So I don't know why. So, so why is it called the Arise if it's only Pusik and Yermia? So, so we know that anything that's a mitzvah is in the Torah. And ain't Navi Rashai Lachadish Davar. The Nevi'im aren't allowed to, to make anything new. So if the Nevi'im write it, that means it must have been a Halach Lamosh Misinai or something. That already existed. So that would be the pshat. Yet, kama and how much can he spend for this dowry for his daughter? Amri Travayu up to one tenth of his uh, of of uh, his property. That's how much he could write for the dowry. Okay, we'll leave it here.